This is Hospitality Huddles, brought to you by Odin Hospitality, the podcast that challenges hoteliers to think differently about F&B to create outlets that guests will love. Every episode, we will speak to the people who are embracing a different mindset to look for opportunities to stand out from the crowd, sharing tips and takeaways to help you get uncomfortable, change your outlook, and see F&B in a whole new way. So let's not wait any longer and dive straight into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of Hospitality Huddles. And today I'm really excited to be joined by Christine Marvin and myself and Christine have chatted quite a few times uh, before this show. But we're here today because Christine is now an author um, and we're going to touch on some of the bits in the book. And I've had the pleasure of, of reading the book uh, in advance of the release um, to be able to talk today about uh, about what was written in there and some of the core messages out of it. So, Christine, really, uh, really, really pleased to be to be here today and talking to you about the book. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks for reading it on the plane. That's typically oh, where wow. I read a lot of books too. So I know it's a good dedicated time where you're you can't move and you're forced to get into something. So exactly. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, for sure. It was uh, six hours to Saudi Arabia and uh, no one can bother you. There's no notifications. I refuse to turn Wi-Fi on on the planes because it's just a nice a nice moment in life where you can forget about everything, isn't it? So That's it's, uh, yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. <laughs> awesome. uh, Krista, we always start the show by asking the question, what does hospitality mean to you? So before we start going into the into the book, what w- how would you answer the question? Yeah, I love that. Um, I know Troy Hooper does that on his show too. Mm. And I was, I just listened to an episode with him this morning, uh, his call to action on, on LinkedIn yesterday uh, yeah. prompted me to to follow it and to listen. Yeah. And so I don't want to repeat what Jim said uh, on the show, but I was thinking about that this morning, which is uh, just so timely. Hospitality to me means giving more than you're receiving. You know, and I think in this business, we are really, really good at giving and serving other people. That's why we got into it. We're not yeah. so, and I'll say, I, some, I will say we, but I mean me, uh, is uh, we're really bad at receiving. And I think um, I've been really bad at receiving over the course of my career. But I think this is just in our nature to to look at ways to give, whether it's through uh, verbal cues, nonverbal cues, uh, you know, a simple, a simple gift is, you know, noticing that somebody's dropped a fork or a napkin and replacing that, you know, anticipating people's needs uh, before they even know what they are to me is hospitality. Yeah, I I, um, I always tell a story on that, Vin. We were, I was working for the Dorchester Collection. I worked as uh, F&B director in uh, Cowarth Park. We had quite a famous Hollywood celebrity that stayed with us for three months. And after about two weeks of coming in the restaurant, he uh, he went to the bathroom and he walked up to the waitress um, a Michelin star restaurant walked up to the waitress and he said that I've left my napkin on the chair don't under any circumstance fold it and put it back on my seat I'm good I'm fine I don't need it folded it's just good where it is and because of who it was uh, and, he, and he just walked off and because of who it was this poor girl didn't know whether to do it didn't know what not whether to do it she was scared to go <laughs> tell the French manager at the time so it's exactly right isn't it it's those little touch points in hospitality that people sometimes take for granted but actually yeah. people really notice the notice what people are doing it's um, that's the the true art of restaurants I think I love it. At the end of the day, you got to give people what they want, right? Whether you 100%. question it, you think it's a test or whatever. Yeah, I love that. Exactly, exactly. So the Hospitality Leaders Roadmap, it's there on the back uh, shelf uh, if you're yeah. watching this on, on YouTube. Uh, so first of all, congratulations. What an amazing feat to uh, to write a book. I guess, how does it feel to now be an author? And <laughs> what inspired you to start writing? You know, it's so interesting. Um, it feel I've o- I've opened thirteen restaurants over the span of my career, and, and I don't have children, and so I, every opening I've compared to birth. So this, when this came in the mail from Amazon, this is my author copy behind me, hence the gray bar in the middle of it. Uh, <laughs> it says not for resale, but uh, when uh, my husband shot a video of me opening it, and you know I was crying and screaming and and all the things, right? All the emotions came out. It felt like opening day. Uh, at a restaurant, right? Like it, I, all that work that we do behind the scenes had really come to life and I had something tangible to hold in my hand. So uh, it's, it, I don't think it's hit me yet either. I'm kind of waiting for launch parties and I'm still in the behind the scenes with, you know, soft launch and things like that right now. So 
Um, it hasn't hit me because I'm so engulfed in the work, but I have this feeling that once I'm in front of people presenting it, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna become real. Um, yeah. And thank you for the congrats. It's this is something that I never dreamed of doing. This really kind of came to me. <laughs> Uh, about two years ago when I started my business and I was just really looking, you know, you know, I'm on a mission to provide as many leadership development resources as possible to this industry, especially in the independent full service space, which is where I specialize and, and where my heart is. And um, there's a couple great books out there, right? There, mm -hmm. Bourdain's got his, you know, setting the table I've got behind me and reasonably, uh, you know, reasonable hospitality, of course. Um, and so I knew, and I love those books, those books meant a lot to me. And so I was hoping that another book would, would mean something to other people too. And so I was inspired to, you know, just kind of create this. It was part of something to make me really uncomfortable, a really cool thing to build the business, you know, and offer in addition to social media posts on LinkedIn every day and the newsletters and the podcast and, and the book just kind of felt like a neck the next natural step for me yeah i think anyone who's listened to your podcast and and linkedin can see the value that you want to bring and i think when i was reading the book what i loved about it versus maybe some of the ones that you've just mentioned was it was almost like i got the feeling like it was a personal memoir that just had a real nice point to every single chapter that went through it like was that intentional did you want it to be quite personal because it 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 felt really vulnerable at times through it and that was when it was talking about your career and even moving into your own business as well yeah you know i've been the type of leader my entire career that's moved really really fast and have, have loved making to-do lists even in my personal life or my days off i'm a very much a hyper achiever it's why i've opened so many restaurants and you know and yeah. and worked in different concepts i love it and um, I don't take the time. I, I, I haven't. I've been working on that. Uh, but I, in my career, I've never really taken the time to slow down and appreciate my accomplishments. Yep. And when I when I've told people some of my story, they often say, "Wow, that's interesting," or they or they don't know what to say after that, or um, or the, they're like, "This is really valuable." That you know. And so through those conversations, I'm like, I think there might be something here. And then through writing the the book i didn't realize i mean i learned so much and it was one of the hardest things i've ever done in my life because i wasn't vulnerable as a leader mm -hmm. and i really wanted to take this opportunity to put it all out there and hold nothing back and that was something my coach really challenged me to do um i i really took the moments and the opportunity to write a chapter or write a section about my career and then pause and reflect on it and see things through a different perspective that I didn't notice when I was 24 or 30. Um, and also kind of move past and process some really tough moments in my life too. So it was really therapeutic and healthy. Yeah. I think, you know, when I look back on my career in hospitality, very similar to you opening restaurants, hotels, there's so much that you forget because so much happens on a daily basis actually kind of doing that bit of writing it all down and I, I'm sure you've been the same right as you go through your career it's like there's another chapter for the book when something happens and yeah. <laughs> getting it down onto paper and, and having that reflection is probably a real nice way to just mark some of those milestones in your career as well isn't it because everyone yeah. I talk to in hospitality has got stories after stories. Yeah, I didn't really. And, and Scott, your story is incredible. Like, I hope you're writing a book or, or will, because the first time you told me your story, I was just like, who am I? This guy's amazing. Um, I didn't realize how many leadership lessons I'd learned over the years. And I didn't realize what I was applying and, and how extraordinary I actually was when I was taking opportunities to invest in my own leadership. And then I realized, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I realized why I completely crashed and burned out in the industry was because I stopped investing in my own leadership and I start I started switching my mindset to think that um, the leaders around me were responsible for creating that environment. And that was a huge mistake. Yeah, do you know, actually, we, we'll talk about that when it, uh, um, soon as you brought it up, but you mentioned a, a leader in, in the book called Richard. And I know you've changed names and, and, and um, locations, but that was one of the core messages that I learned from there is I think that was a moment where you really saw that it's about you taking ownership. And I think you talked about a, per, a, a 
personal uh, improvement plan and bits like that. And I, yeah. I think every I think a lot of people do have those moments, but there's still people uh, out there and young leaders in the industry who look up to people and rely on it. What was that kind of uh, light switch moment during that process that helped you go from, I guess, kind of expecting that to then taking it in your own destiny? Yeah, you know, I really actually didn't realize that lesson until after I had burned out and um, quit drinking and started working with a coach and really got mm. clear. Then I looked back and went, oh my gosh, here's okay. here's where I was four or five years ago. Mm. I think, again, you know, in the early points of, of my career, when I was hungry and growing and chasing certifications to be a sommelier and a mixologist and, and reading Danny's book and, and training all my opening teams on it and investing in myself constantly, I was at the height of my career. I was happy. I, I've always loved to work hard. That's uh, that's never going to stop for me. But I was in it. I loved it. Every day I got up and I was excited to go to work, no matter if I was completely exhausted, physically in pain, you know, from a long week or, or uh, again, flipping the restaurant over and over and over again for the Democratic National Convention and, you know, 08, whatever it was. Um I got out of bed excited to go do what I was going to do every single day. And and being put on a performance improvement plan and working for a leader for three years that I should have removed myself from should have been a really big red flag to me that something was majorly wrong. It was so much larger than just the lack of relationship and trust and respect between the two of us. It was a bigger message that I was really unhappy in my role and what I was doing. And in that moment, I wish I would have realized that in the independent space is where I thrived and had empowerment and autonomy and creativity. And when I got into growing a chain restaurant from six to 48 locations in seven years, and then we stopped growing in my region, that was the moment for me where I was like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm here. And and that should have been the big moment of insight for me. But like I said, I didn't figure that out until years later. And then until I got in this role as an entrepreneur, and then I went, Oh, my God, this is why I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. Because I'm back yeah. in the independent space, you know? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's funny, that juncture that that you had setting up your own business and doing the same, I had exactly the same thing um, when, when I set my own, and it probably caused me to set my own business up, because it helped me realize when I was in a role that I was probably in a little bit too longer than I should have done. And found myself away from where I wanted to be it was that kind of moment where it, I I and it was one of the reasons I joined the Burnt Chef project it was like if people are like the two of us who've had long careers you would think have seen it all you would think would know the moments probably advise people to 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 leave jobs that they're, they're stuck in totally then yeah. find themselves in that position that's where <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's it's important that people like yourself to write books like this, podcasts that we can share some of our experience because um, now I find the new generation of workforce are probably going will leave the leave the industry rather than uh, stick around and see what's next. And I think that's the bit that we've got to we've got to try and help protect a little bit. And um, one thing that you touched on a, a couple of times as we've as we've already been speaking, and and it's something that I picked up out of out of the book is. Um, if I had to sum up your career from reading your book, I, I would use two words, and that would be ambitious and determined. And I think um, it's it's definitely qualities that I had in my career, and I think they helped me have some of my best successes, but it also taught me some of my greatest lessons. Um, is that the same for you? Like, Is there a balance between ambition and determination, self care looking after yourself looking after others um do you now know looking back where that balance kind of is or was or is it yeah. still figuring it out yeah it's a that's a great question you know i talk a lot about with clients positive intelligence and mental fitness and helping people recognize their negative thoughts that cause all their stress and anxiety and resentment right and all yeah. that I had a perfect example of this this morning. So I, I have a morning routine of three hours from five to eight every morning um, where I get up and I take care of myself. I plan my meals. I walk the dogs. I'm outside. I, I exercise, meditate, journal, whatever I need in the space. I got up this morning and I was, I didn't sleep well last night because I didn't eat well yesterday. And, um, and I know exactly <clears throat> why, but I felt like shit this morning. And I was, was like, 
I got to talk to Scott today. I've got a to-do list of things to do. And uh, I immediately, but I still do my morning routine. So I got outside and I started listening to Troy's show. And then I got into another show and my mind just started working on the next projects that I want to start completing in for the next phase of the business. And so I started to go down that slope again of creating the to-do list and check it out, even though I'm tired, even though I've yeah. got another to-do list to do today. And in the and years past, I would have just taken that train and gone full, you know, full throttle on it. What's different now, though, and, and what I've learned as far as setting boundaries and self-care was when I got back in the car and I started capturing all those notes and organizing them as I do mm -hmm. into my personal management knowledge system, I said to myself, stop, just capture the notes. You've got them there. What you really need right now is to go home and stretch and do some yoga and feel better and calm your brain down because you've got to be able to focus and be really present in the moment with where you're at today. Mm -hmm. And when I was moving a million miles an hour in the restaurant industry and drinking, that was just something to numb the pain quickly and get on to the next thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it takes constant management to build those, those muscles in your brain to find that balance, set those boundaries, learn how to say no and uh and check yourself and build that self-awareness it's funny um i i think sometimes that's where we're a really unhealthy industry though isn't it because um i think one of the things that i found running my own business is there's a lot more discipline that i can have in my day because i own my day uh whereas i've just been in saudi arabia as we spoke about and i was sat in the offices of the clients we were in and there's people being pulled from pillar to post and as guys being put in meetings there's you know one of the um, board members turned up and killed everyone's diary and the guy at nine o'clock was catching up on all his emails and I think it's it's about how um, people can bring some of those non-negotiables and some of those boundaries into the workplace to help do exactly what you're saying which is prioritize what's important for your performance and and your health in in the long run isn't it yeah, it's interesting. When I was in fine dining, I felt like it was a much healthier space. I worked for dinner only concept. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, the the restaurant was nice and quiet as we ever okay. all the staff came in and we got to quietly prepare and plan everything. And then we took 15 to 30 minutes to sit down for pre-shift to really be present to talk about mm -hmm. our plan, right? What we were going to go execute. And then we'd check in at the end of the shift together for a couple minutes too and talk about how it went, whether that was one-on-ones or as a team. It's when I got more into the lunch and dinner service all day long. That's where, you know, my days started expanding, expanding from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., 11, 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. You know, when I tell my husband at 8 o'clock, oh, reservations are, you know, our last push is at 7, I'll be home by 8.30, and then 10, 10.30 rolls around. Uh, yeah. You know, so yeah. I, really, I, th I really think it depends on the environment. And hotels, right? I was in there for five years, and mm -hmm. you're always on. You know, I was, I was 24 working 80 hours a week. I loved mm -hmm. it. Because <laughs> what yeah. else did I have to do, right? But exactly. I think it depends on where you're at in your life and your career and, um, you know, and just what kind of concept you're working for, too. And and obviously the leadership, right? The the example that mm. we set for everybody else. Yeah, I think that's really important. And and you talk early on in the book about um, how Danny Meyer and reading Setting the Table made quite an impact on you. You've talked already about how you use that in your leadership style. How much influence did it have? Because it it really comes through in the book quite a bit. Man, he was like my fiance or Taylor Swift in, in today's, <laughs> you know, world of terminology. Uh, I was 24, you know, obviously Danny's from St. Louis. I'm from Missouri, from a small town. I, I, I was never really a big dreamer. I, you know, when I started getting into restaurants and read his book, I immediately was like, I'm going to move to New York and I'm going to work for Danny Meyer and this is going to be the best, you know, and then I met my husband in college. And so, uh, that, <laughs> you know, I tease him all the time. I would be in New York if it wasn't for you, um, <laughs> which is a great thing. But that was such an eye opening moment for me that someone could really build a business out of this and take a huge leap of, uh, you know, finding investment of a million dollars and making your dreams come true. Mm -hmm. And that book just resonated with me so much. Um, as far as just how he thought about hospitality and provided hospitality to the guests and really provided a lot of tangible examples that I could immediately apply in what I was doing every single day, which is the best way that people learn as we know. Right. So once I got a hold of that and then, the, you know, when I was working at the hotel at the time, 
we were opening a fine dining concept that I was invited to be a part of from the management perspective. And they said, Hey, we, we just hired a GM from union square, um, hospitality group. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Like I get to, this is live. We're going to do this live. This is amazing. I get to learn all the things I've read in this book. So, uh, it was just a magical moment for me. And, and again, I was 24 and it just, that really started to shape who I was as a leader and, um, seeing how you could really run a successful restaurant at that age, at that level, uh, has, I still go back and read that book today because it just resonates, uh, so much. So it's just meant the world to me. Yeah. And I think, um, it's probably a book that might have got lost a bit now with things like unreasonable hospitality and so many out there. And, and it's a book that I still have today. And I think anyone who's coming into the industry knew, um to go and read it i think it's the it's great advice and you know you'll probably be surprised exactly what he's done through his career that now doesn't probably get talked about enough when you think of shake shack and all the rest of it as well so yeah um, yeah well so, and it's yeah, interesting it's, too right i mean will obviously worked for danny so it's kind of this mm. cool spawn right yeah exactly of, of yeah him taking it to the next for level sure. yeah definitely so um i guess we, we've covered the kind of career looking at where it is and then the book kind of takes a bit of a swerve when it starts talking about your kind of your your addiction with alcohol and and how that had an impact on your career and relationships i asked you earlier if anything was off limits on this and you said no let's go for it because it's important that that yeah. we we talk about the message so no question from me i guess over to you to just talk about it and um, talk about if people are listening to this now and what you're about to say is resonates, how yeah. people can can tackle it. Totally. You know, I have a, a love hate relationship with alcohol. Uh, chapter two in the book is sex, drugs and alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. Me experience, you know, moving from a small town to a, a larger town, I guess, little city, uh, getting a restaurant job at 19, um, you know, discovering sex, drugs and alcohol in the industry. That was how I was really uh, turned on to all of those th things. I was a really sheltered kid, um, from all that stuff. So that was really eye opening for me. And then again, moving into the early days of my management career, chasing the sommelier certification, marrying somebody who was a uh, SOM and ended up selling wine to restaurants for 15 years. Um, and studying with mixologists out of New York, I was, I had a great relationship with alcohol in terms of appreciation and, and, pairing it with food and and the flavor profiles and the beauty of bringing culture from beautiful wines from France and Italy into food, into food, into the experience. And I was constantly learning and growing. And um, the scene in Denver was the, the restaurant scene and the cocktail scene was exploding when we got there in 2007. It was just every restaurant had an amazing cocktail program, an amazing wine list, right? And my husband was involved in that. And I was obviously, you know, we were growing the industry as well during that time. So we, again, we don't have children. So happy hour was daily for us when possible. And our entire circle of friends was in the restaurant business or the wine world uh, or the distribution side. And so it was very much uh, for a while there was, you know, we balanced it really well. You know, mm -hmm. my husband would have liquor meetings as part of his job, right? Like we'd go in and taste restaurants. Uh, we would drink every single day. He would bring home bags of wine that were, you know, six bottles unopened and or open. And we were like, well, we got to drink it or it's going to go bad or we got to cook with it. So alcohol was very much a part of our daily lives. But I would say, you know, I was really good at taking breaks and, and running and being athletic and going to the gym every morning and riding the Peloton. And uh, I had a very a healthy approach to, uh, to work and, and it was very, very invested. And again, when it started to turn South and really get dark was when I realized, well, I didn't realize it at the time, but was when I was very unhappy in my career, very unhappy with leadership, not in the environment that I was thriving in. I didn't know why I wasn't allowing myself to realize that. And I started to cover up stress and anxiety from drinking alcohol. So instead of going home at the end of the day and working out or journaling or meditating or going for a walk or doing something healthy, I immediately ran from work to the bar. And then that escalated to 
me planning my day and setting my last meeting around what time could I get done so I could start drinking. And then the pandemic hit where I started to work from home more and isolate myself because I only wanted to go into my locations when I absolutely needed to for safety reasons, Mm -hmm. but nobody could see what I was doing. Right. And I was an introvert and it was again, just a, a tool to, to shut off the stress of watching the news every day, waiting for good news to happen. When can we go back to normal? This is a nightmare, right? The agenda was not my agenda. I had all these big aspirations around culture and people development and and leadership development that I wanted to focus on. And I was just being pulled in a different direction, right? Mm. With the pandemic. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, it took, uh, you know, know, I, I, again, talk about this in the book, but my husband and I had been traveling to Mexico for 10 years and I had been instituting the three day effect, which is you go into nature or go on vacation or somewhere and you unplug, disconnect from technology for 72 hours. Um, and your cognitive ability and your problem solving increases by or improves by 50%. I was doing that for 10 days. So when we go on these vacations, after three days, I would start reading books, investing in myself, setting personal goals, professional goals. And I'd come home locked and loaded with a clear path of what my next year was going to look like. Mm. The three years I was really unhappy in my career and we were still vacationing. I spent those 10 days drinking even heavier morning, noon, and night drinking tequila. So it wasn't until, you know, my 40th birthday, we came home. I woke up, looked at myself in the mirror, disgusted by who I was, didn't recognize myself in the mirror and was really frustrated with what I was doing to myself, I had more ambition. I right. like you, and I appreciate you saying ambitious and driven earlier. Deep down, that's who I am, and I'd completely lost sight of that. Um, and when I admitted to myself, I need to get some help. I need to stop living like this. I'm going to die. An hour later, my husband had a seizure from going through alcohol withdrawal, mm-hmm. and that turned into a couple more. And then we stopped drinking, and then we started drinking again, and it got really dangerous. And then he had a seizure behind the wheel. Luckily, he was okay. Um, and then I passed out an airport. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just, we both had to hit rock bottom in our times, in our own times, to really take a step back and prioritize what was important to us. And mm-hmm. stopping drinking has been the best decision we've ever made. We value everything in our life so much more. And it's helped us in our relationship, our relationships with family and friends. I'm a better dog mom. I take better care of myself. Uh, my business is doing well, right? Of course, it just um, it impacts every single aspect of your life. But it's also opened the door for us to, you know, for me especially, to get really invested in the non-alcoholic scene because I love the NA cocktails, the NA wines, yeah. what's happening with, with this movement, the healthy aspects to it. But it's fun and it's playful and it's innovative and it's something new that a lot of restaurants are bringing on and that Gen Z and a lot of people want, right? I've, I've talked to a girl that uh, is a distributor up in um, up in uh, St. Paul, and she said 94% of people that are ordering NA uh, wines or cocktails in restaurants are drinkers. They're starting mm-hmm. with something on the NA side to hydrate, and then they're moving into ordering their wine with dinner. So th- there's more balance out there now, yeah. um, which I wish I would have found back in the day. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Because um, I was on a panel actually at the, at the turn of the year um, on the same subject. And um, there was some people there from Asahi, uh, Peroni and Britvic. And they were saying that now what they're seeing in the market is people are breaking up. They're not binge drinking, binge drinking as much, and they're breaking up sessions with non-alcoholic uh, beers or, or cocktails. And in in the um, in the uh, book, you talk about how there was the first bit where you where you went sober, and then the reason you started drinking again was when you went into a restaurant and someone didn't know that you were sober and gave you a free glass of champagne and, and you started drinking. And when I was reading that, and obviously I'm close to this because I, I hear stories from the Burnt Chef Project and, and what you, that accessibility of alcohol is something in the industry that is a problem for people in the industry as well, isn't it? Because it, it I remember... Yeah. 
like the first thing we would do when people used to come into our restaurants, we'd always take glasses of champagne. We'd always put champagne in bedrooms. We'd like it, it was just a natural reaction. Team incentives was alcohol and and all the rest of it. And I think um, I think if we want to make a more healthy work environment, because there's stress, because there's long hours, because the people need to release, I think we've got to get a little bit more mindful of that. Because situations like like yourself, it's all too easy for for those mistakes, I guess, to, to happen, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The accessibility is a, is a huge part of it. You know, uh, we know being in the industry that, um, it's easy to give away booze, yeah. right. From an access to, from the bar to the dining room, uh, from the cost standpoint, right. We've, we've worked, uh, our, in our careers negotiating prices with distributors so that yeah. we can give away free product. Right. And so it's funny because Tyler and I were very, uh, cautious and thorough when we went out, we would look at NA options on menus. You know, we had to message, we had to figure out, team up together and collaborate on how we were going to message to our friends and family, how, you know, that we weren't drinking, but we had built such a network of people all over the city, uh, that, you know, when we went into restaurants anywhere, what did you do? You know, you were immediately greeted with a spirit or, the bartenders would come over depending on the time of day and you'd all start with a shot together. Right. Mm -hmm. So something about that experience, I don't know what it was, but it just snuck up on us. And in that moment, neither one of us spoke up and then we kind of looked at each other and went, can we handle this right now? And then it just, our ego got the way. And, you know, we, we quickly found out that we couldn't, but yeah, the accessibility is interesting. And I think, um, I'm really excited to see again, more restaurants having, you know, creating a more inclusive environment, and having non-alcoholic options on their menu. Some have a separate category. Some are blending them mm-hmm. in with their wines and their beers and their cocktails, which I love. Because yeah. if you're uncomfortable or you're with someone and you're not ready to message that you're you're not drinking, especially from a female perspective where you often get the, are you pregnant question or or mm-hmm. is something wrong with you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a really great way to to offer a really safe environment for people. But yeah, it's, you know, Burnt Chef, you know, we talk about it at Chow. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, shift drinks at the end of the night, you know, are still a really big thing. And I was talking to an operator recently and he said, I want to take away shift drinks, but it's, I'm, I'm afraid about how it, I'm afraid of how it's going to impact our culture. And that really saddened me. Yeah. Um, that's for sure. So it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and we need to, it, it, people, people need to make more of it and it needs to become more normalized because that exact language that that you've just said is one of the issues isn't it and it's some of the reasons why people don't come out and be honest or maybe don't recognize themselves because they're too busy trying to convince themselves it's okay because they don't want to stand out rather than kind of tackling the problem and I think um that goes from there into into I think the chapter's called burnout and you talk a lot about that kind of rock bottom and burnout do you think do you think that was caused by the alcohol or do you think that was the stress or the the challenge of the of the job you were in or a combination of both and i think you know it's burnout is something i'm starting to see a lot more of recently whether it's become more aware or or just um people are kind of um more tuned to it and i think this is one of those where people listening if one person's there right now and listens to this and and we talk about the signs and it helps. I think we, you know, we, we've done as much as we could probably do at this point, but talk a bit more about burnout and how that kind of came about and, and how you managed to tackle it. Yeah. The alcohol was just a vehicle, right? If you are burnt out, uh, you can use alcohol, you can use tobacco, you can use ice cream, you can use anything, um, to cover it up. You've got to get to the root cause of the problem, which, Typically, burnout occurs. A lot of the clients that I work with and research I've done on this, it occurs when you're doing something that's not aligned with your core values. So if you're in a position where you're unhappy, it's important to understand why that's happening. If you are uh, experiencing signs of burnout, such as not being able to turn work off, um, not being able to be present in the moment with your friends and family, uh, exhaustion, you're, you are irritable, you're angry, you're not looking forward to what you're doing. And it's, and these things are going to happen on a daily basis sometimes, but when it's happening consecutively, when it's like a week straight or two weeks straight, and you you can't recover 
from it on your days off, if you're like, oh, two days off is never enough, there's something there that is speaking to a larger issue that really needs to be addressed. And, you know, because again, it, hard, especially in our industry, hard work is always going to be there, right? This industry is always going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. But if your mindset is in a place where you can't see those challenges coming at you as opportunities to grow, something's wrong. And, and it's not, yes, it may be burnout, but you may need to take a step back and start working on your mindset, right? Which is what I do with yeah. a, a lot of people, because if you can shift your perspective on something, it can completely change your life. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably highlighted a real um, uh, topic there in terms of what burnout truly is um, and what can cause it. I think some people might just think it's working so hard that you tie yourself out and, and all the rest. But I think that whole piece around that core values is really interesting. And if I think about kind of the, the business I was talking about where I, I hung around a bit too long, it was definitely some of those signs were definitely coming because you feel trapped you don't know what the answer is you don't know what to do etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think it's um it's one of those where when i look back on it now i kind of i talk about that values piece of it was starting to break too many values that i held it close to my heart and i was having to explain too many things to my team where the team were questioning it and I was trying to defend it, but couldn't really defend it and was getting in this thing of, am I looking unprofessional or, or not? And I think it's, um, I didn't quite get to that stage because I, I, I probably left just in time, but I can re relate to some of those things that you're saying. And I think it's um, back to that point of, if we experience that after so many years in, in our careers, again, people lower down the ranks, we have to educate so that, we're not getting the same things earlier in careers because it's probably definitely led to me not being operational now. Uh, yeah. I, I, from the conversations it, we had, it's the same. Totally. And I, you know, I, when I was burning out, I worked for an amazing company who cared about their people, who was growing in all the right directions for all the right reasons, who had a wonderful sustainability program, who had a wonderful community focus, who was great at recruiting people. Retain, I mean, the company was amazing. It wasn't them. It was part of it was leadership, but again, I take full responsibility for this. It was me, you know, growing a single concept was not mm. something that I was um that I ever wanted to do. I I just I never wanted to work for a chain. I never wanted to be in a in a corporate type envi of environment. And again, I didn't realize that until I created my own business where it took me back to the independent space of opening different concept after different concept where I was able to be creative and innovative and throw shit at the wall and see what sticks and and just learn from others and not have to, you know, funnel my ideas or decisions through a group of people. It it, it was all, you know, it's all about me. <laughs> my yeah, only child yeah. is very happy right now. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. No, no, it's yeah. definitely true though. And and I guess the, the way the book ends is very much on that positive message in terms of, and I know it, it's not easy having your own business. And we've talked about this kind of um, as we've connected before, but um, like how how did it end up that you went in to, to do your own thing? And what's been super rewarding? And what would you say were the biggest challenges? Yeah, I think uh, I started working with a coach because I was completely lost. I had, I knew I wanted to get out of operations, but I, and every five years or so I was like, Oh, I'm going to leave the industry. Oh, maybe there's something else out there. And then I'd, I'd look for 30 seconds and go, I don't, I don't know how my skill set's going to apply to anything yeah. else, which is absolutely ridiculous. Cause we can do anything with the skills we have. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially from this business. So I started working with a coach and I just, I was like, I need somebody to hold up a mirror for me and call me out of my bullshit and hold me accountable and help me make some commitments and get back to myself. And um, our third or fourth session, I had a huge moment of insight where I just, from a big picture perspective, I looked at the conversation. It was very much like this, just on Zoom. And I realized what was happening in that moment with that one-on-one -on -one coaching was exactly what I'd been doing in the restaurant industry for the past 20 years leading teams. And I realized that that was what I loved was that one-on-one -on -one communication, slowing down, strategizing, helping people build their confidence, be better problem solvers, creating some action plans and commitments, and then getting back to it. And so I just said in that moment, this is how I can stay connected to hospitality and still do what I love. And I just I immediately started taking coaching courses. And after my first course, I was like, I'm starting my business. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is it. This is it for me. So, yeah. Amazing. And um, what would you say was, uh, if you look back now on on like a couple of years, what what is the biggest success? Like, what things have been the kinks in the road that you maybe didn't expect and and overcame? Oh man, I think you know. I sometimes I think success changes daily. I think the you know the big success for me was that before I started this business, I designed my lifestyle. I'd never done that before. It was important to me that I never burned out again. And I knew that serving people in hospitality, again, like we talked about earlier, was about giving a lot. And starting your own company is about giving a lot of value for a long time until it catches <laughs> on, right? <laughs> um, I, I knew that I wanted to redesign my lifestyle, invest in that first. So I took a few months to really get into that routine. Then I started building the business. So the success for me, you know, some people, a lot of people measure success differently, right? It could be financial goal, it could be number of clients, it could be your projects, books, whatever. For me, it is being able to check in and go, I am still living that life. I'm still outside. I'm still taking care of myself. I'm still spending time with my husband. I'm still a good dog mom. I'm, I'm traveling. Um, I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I'm still developing and investing in myself. That's really, really important for me. I'm really impatient though. So I thought this was going to like take off in six months. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I just, you know, I call it naive, but I also, I'm just kind of fearless and I, you know, again, ambitious yeah. and driven. So I know if I'm going to work hard, things are going to happen. But I, I would say I was surprised by a lot. I didn't go into this be, uh, expecting to be a, a content creator. I, I'm a coach mm -hmm. first and foremost, and will always be. And somebody said to me in January, oh, you're a content creator. And I was like, what? Like, what is, what is that? So anyway, I just, I love that now. I embrace that now, uh, which has been a really good mind shift, but, but definitely something unexpected, uh, along this journey for sure. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, I think it's interesting. I think if you'd have said to me before about, uh, what does success look like? I think because in many corporate businesses, especially you're ingrained in budgets and, and financials, it would probably have been based on, on that. Whereas now in my own business, it's more about growth uh, in in the business and the fact that we're still here after two and a bit years and a lot of people <laughs> who try it fail. The fact that I get to see my kids more because as we talked about earlier, I can set my own. And it's funny how that shift, uh, and, and I'm always careful sometimes of glorifying doing your own thing because it's not easy. And, it's, and, right. and there is some moments where you kind of sit there going, shit, should I just go get a job because it's easier? Um, <laughs> but that, but that, re that bit, I think uh, about that shift from very uh, artificial, very kind of like false in a way, like targets that you're achieving for someone else versus when it's on it, it's growth, whatever that means, whether it's business, whether it's personal, whether it's spending more time for your kids. Yeah, that's the bit that I found as like probably the biggest surprise to me in in doing my business with with Arden as well. Yeah. And I think it's, I've learned so much from being in such a structured environment and also a very non-structured environment, right? Yeah. So the business is a, is a beautiful blend. I don't, you know, I've never really liked the corporate terminology, uh, you know, the KPIs and things like that. But, yeah. you know, I've been able, just like with, with anything else, I've been able to take everything that I've learned and then, you know, morph it and create it and blend it into this this beautiful lifestyle and, and business that I um, I want to run. And I, and I love doing every single day. Yeah. And I guess to finish that the book, I, I really enjoyed it. I've said it a bit um, and I'd really encourage anyone to read it because I just think it's a great lesson of kind of highs and lows. And I think it sums the industry up perfectly, even if you take out all the, the detail and just kind of take the roller coaster that goes through. Um, and I'm really pleased that you, you kind of succeed in and, and in a great place. If people are listening to this and go, Do you know, what, I'm going to get the book. What what would be the one key takeaway that you'd like them to to take away from from reading it? Yeah, I think the cool thing that I love about this book is that you can come back to this book. You don't have to read the whole thing. A lot of people don't, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's 36 chapters. They're very small. They're quick reads, as you know. You can come back to this book in any journey in your career, whether you're a line cook at 15, AGM, GM, regional manager, managing partner, and there are six podcast episodes in the book where you can dive a little bit deeper into the conversations or connect on a little bit different level. Mm -hmm. So it's something you can come back to often. 
um, you know, check out the podcast. There, there's additional resources in it. And uh, if somebody's curious about a topic and they want to have a conversation with me about it or learn even more about it, my door is always open. Um, I'd love to love to have that conversation with people and help even more. Yeah, I um, we're doing a, a an F and B report at the minute, uh, and uh, I'm I'm going to admit I've stolen your podcast idea from the book because how oh, it's got the little bits in there where you can go and delve in deeper. I love that. I thought that was I thought that was a really cool way of using the the two things together. And um, last thing, I haven't asked you about really telling people what the business is, what it does, how you can help people. So we should definitely finish with that uh, sure. before we go. And everyone's like, oh, what does she actually do? <laughs> <laughs> what does she do? Yeah, exactly. Have, the, the, Great I, author. I, I, what uh, else is there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I still have those conversations. I don't know if you're like that too, but I'll have coffee with somebody or a phone call and get off the phone and be like, I don't know. I forgot to ask that person what they do. Because you just we just get can you know involved yeah, yeah. In, in connection and engaged. So uh, so my company is Solutions by Kristen. I work with individuals independent restaurant owners and operators. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, leadership workshops, but I really work with them to identify and overcome their biggest challenges so that they can um, become more mentally fit and spend time and energy where they want. Typically, people come to me and say, I've got a challenge. And, and once we sit down and spend an hour together and create that space for them, we realize it's not actually that challenge. It's another one or a couple things. And so we really start to create a vision about what success looks like for them, remove those roadblocks, create a path to get there um, and celebrate the success, which is great. Perfect. And what we'll put LinkedIn uh, profile, link to the book, link to the podcast. We'll put it all in the show notes as well so people can can get hold of you if they want to know more. But Christine, uh, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate I know you're busy promoting, so to make some time to to come on to the readers, uh, to the listeners as well, sorry. And, um, and I hope you sell lots of copies because I think people will take lots of value from it. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. I appreciate it. And the book, uh, I have to say before we leave, uh, it'll be available on Amazon, ebook, paperback, and audiobook on October 15th. Uh, and then it'll be on my website later. And then 10% uh, of sales from the book from October 15th through the end of the year will go to Chow. So um, we offer mental health and substance abuse resources to people in the hospitality industry. So it's a beautiful organization, similar to Burnt, Burnt Chef. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it's a great resource for people to go and get hold of uh, uh, free help and support. And I think the industry needs more people like like the Chows and the Burnt Chefs, so they just need yeah. to keep growing, don't they? So um, yeah, for sure. Definitely people check that out. We'll drop those in the show notes as well, because uh, it might be a useful resource if people have been listening. So thank you very much and uh, best of luck. Thanks, Scott. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to Hospitality Huddles, brought to you by Auden Hospitality. If you want to see how we can help you think differently for your next F&B project, then learn more by visiting our website at audenhospitality.com. If you want to revisit clips from this or previous episodes, make sure you visit our YouTube channel at Auden Hospitality. Thank you for listening to the show and see you next time.